Welcome to my continued coverage of Chapter 2, Ions, Molecules, and Atoms. In this video, I will teach you about ionic compounds' names and formulas. Before doing that, though, I must begin with a hilarious college freshman of the day. I mean, no offense to you freshmen, but this is funny. And I stole it, of course, from quickmeme.com. It says, my first chem exam is tomorrow. I did fine in high school without studying. 12 out of 100. Ha 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 Now, to my college freshmen who are taking this class, please don't follow this memes example. So, in a previous lecture that I've linked to in the description below, we learned the difference between ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Now, as we discussed in that lecture, in their journey toward feeling like a noble gas, when a metal and a non-metal bond, the metal more or less completely transfers its valence electron or electrons to the non-metal. This process forms two ions, a metal cation, which is a positively charged ion, and a non-metal anion, which is a negatively charged ion. The bond that's formed here is called an ionic bond. In contrast, when two non-metals bond, they don't transfer electrons, but instead just share them to help each other feel like noble gases. This sharing can be very even and equal if the two atoms are equally electronegative or close thereto, or very imbalanced and lopsided if one atom is more electronegative than the other. Now, this type of bond is called a covalent bond. So a bond with equal sharing is called a nonpolar covalent bond, while a bond with unequal sharing is called a polar covalent bond. This is all summarized clearly in this beautiful diagram here. Now compounds that contain ionic bonds are called ionic compounds. These are ones in which metals give away electrons and nonmetals take them. In contrast, Molecules that are all nonmetals and covalent bonds are called molecular compounds. They're not called covalent compounds. Sorry about that. While molecules that contain metals in them have metallic bonds and are called metallic compounds. We won't discuss these until a later chapter. With that background reviewed, I now teach you how to generate an ionic formula. So when a metal and nonmetal get together to form an ionic compound, they have to do it in the right amounts so that they balance out each other's charges. The way this works is we write down our metal on the left in our formula, and we write above it whatever its charge is, be it plus one, plus two, plus three, or whatever. To the right, we write down the non-metal group with its charge, be it a negative one, negative two, negative three, or whatever. Then what we do is we take the charge up here by the X, and we remove the plus next to it, and move it down here as a subscript next to the non-metal. We then take the number Y here and remove the negative from in front of it and move it down here as a subscript or number next to the metal. And then we write down the resulting formula. Does that make sense? Now it turns out mathematically that if we do this, the charges will cancel each other out so that we have a completely even balance of positives canceling out negatives. And what charges do elements have? Well, as I discussed in an earlier video linked to in the description below, Elements over here on the right, the nonmetals want to have negative charges. For example, elements in column 7a have negative ones because they want to move one column to the right in terms of how they feel to attain that noble gas configuration. By comparison, elements in column 6a or group 6a want to have negative two charges, and in group or column 5a want to have negative threes. Aluminum, for reasons that I also explained in a previous video that I've linked to in the description below, wants to have a charge of plus three. Elements in group two want to be plus twos because they want to get rid of electrons and shift to the left to attain the noble gas configuration of the noble gas that precedes them on the periodic table. And metals in column one want to be plus ones. Hydrogen is kind of interesting because it can be either a plus one or a minus one depending on what it's bonded to, as we'll discuss later on. Now with that said, you might ask this question. What about the D block that we keep ignoring? These elements that are colorized red here. What charges do they want to have? Well, as it turns out, many of the elements in the D block, which are called the transition metals, can exist as ions with various different charges, depending on what they're bonded to. For example, zinc and cadmium like to exist most stably as having a plus two charge. Silver likes to have a plus one charge, and copper can have either a plus one or plus two charge, depending on what it's attached to. Iron similarly can exist as a plus two or plus three, again, depending on what it's bonded to. And scandium and yttrium both generally like to attain a state or charge of plus three. The remaining elements in the D block can have charges all over the place. And that also remains true for most of the elements down here in the F block that I'm choosing to ignore for now, but we'll address later on. Now, again, this variability in the D block elements charges will come into play and be important in just a few moments. So how do we name ionic compounds? Well, when naming ionic compounds, that is compounds that have metals and nonmetals together, such as NaCl, 
we follow these rules. One, the atom on the left in our formula, which is the metal cation, in this case an Na+, is just given its regular name from the periodic table if it's not an element in the D block. Now, if it is a D block element, then it's given its regular name plus a Roman numeral after it to indicate its charge in our formula. Two, the anion in our formula, in this case Cl-, minus, is given its regular name, such as chlorine or fluorine, whatever anion you're dealing with here, except the end of its name gets replaced with the suffix "-ied". So in the case of chlorine, we wouldn't call it chlorine when it's in a compound and we're trying to write down the name. We would instead call it chloride, indicating that it has a negative charge. So the name of NaCl is sodium chloride. Let's master this by taking a look at some lecture questions. First, the correct name for this compound is what? Okay, we answered this question by going through the rules I just laid out. The first one is the atom on the left is just given its regular name if it's not in the D block. Now magnesium is not in the D block. It's in column two of the periodic table. So we don't have to worry about anything else. We just write down its regular periodic table elemental name, which is magnesium. So that's the first half of our name. Now what do we do with the second half, these chlorines over here? Well, that is rule two. The anion, in this case it's a Cl-, minus, is given its regular name, which is chlorine, or if you had an F, it would be fluorine, except the end of its name gets replaced with the suffix "-ide". So instead of calling it chlorine here, we call it chloride. So the systematic formulaic name for this compound would be magnesium chloride. Make sense? Now, one thing I need to stress here that might become confusing later on is that when naming ionic compounds, we never ever include prefixes like mono, di, tri, tetra, penta. We never ever include those. We do include those prefixes in the names of molecular compounds, which I'll cover in a later video. Let's do another example. The correct name for this compound is what? As per usual, we cover this by going through our rules. One, the atom on the left is just given its regular name. Now, if it's an element in the D block, which this element, iron, which has the elemental symbol Fe, is, then we also have to add a Roman numeral after its name to indicate its charge. Now, you might look at iron and ask, what charge is it? How do we determine that? Well, because iron is in the D block, there's no way to look at it and just know from where it's located on the periodic table what charge it's going to have. So how do you figure out its charge in this formula? You do it by deriving its charge from the charge of the other element in the formula. In this case, the other element is chlorine. You'll notice that chlorine is one column away from the nearest noble gas, argon, so it's going to want to have a negative one charge. It's going to want to take one electron away. So we go back to our formula and take note of that by writing a negative one above our chlorine. Now we're not done yet. We aren't going to just give our iron a plus one charge to bounce out that negative one. Why? Because this formula doesn't have a single individual chlorine atom. It has three chlorine atoms indicated by this three subscript. In other words, each molecule of this compound contains one iron surrounded by three chlorides, each of which has a negative one. So there's a negative one and a negative one and another negative one. So what's the total combined charge of all three of those chlorides together? Yeah, it's three times negative one, which is negative three. So what charge is the iron going to have to have in order to balance out or cancel out that negative three? Yeah, it's going to have to have a plus three. So in order to determine the iron's charge, we have to derive it from the chloride's total charge. Make sense? With that information, we can now write down the first half of our name. It's going to be iron, and because the iron is in the D block on the periodic table, we have to add a Roman numeral to the right of its name in order to indicate what charge it has. And this particular iron has a plus three charge. So the first half of our name is iron three. Make sense? Now on to rule number two. The anion is given its regular name chlorine or fluorine, except that we add the suffix "-ide", at the end of it. In this case, then, it's not going to be called chlorine, it's going to be called chloride. So the correct name for this ionic compound is iron-3-chloride. 